thank you for staying tuned. We are now going to discuss the different forms of renewables and we'll start with green hydrogen. So uh, green hydrogen, uh, which is more accurately not a source of energy, but a form of energy storage because energy is used to break either methane or water to produce the hydrogen. And we know that 95% of hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels by a process of gasifying coal to produce hydrogen, methane and CO2 or steam reformation of methane to produce hydrogen and CO2. Uh, when the water molecules are used as the raw material, the resulting hydrogen is called green hydrogen. And this accounts for less than 5% of the total hydrogen production uh, in the world today. So uh, with this in mind, Daktari, green hydrogen was promoted during the African Climate Summit because its production does not produce carbon dioxide. However, it is dependent on the availability of water which is a scarce resource, and uh, desalination of salty water, <coughs> excuse me, for production of hydrogen is also very expensive. So, in your opinion, is it practical for green hydrogen to be used as a replacement for diesel and petrol in transport and manufacturing of our industries, in our industries? Uh, thank you, Joyce. Uh, uh, this, um green hydrogen debates uh, all in the broader context we are calling it power to x is a new uh, uh, perspective in uh, the uh, renewable energy uh, sector and in uh, what you're calling green manufacturing for example um uh, many years ago over a decade ago uh, we used to say that uh, hydrogen is a precursor to an electric economy. So everyone knows that uh, the apex of energy supply is electricity. It is the cleanest and the most efficient and the most desired uh, form of energy, electricity. Uh, but for us to get there, we need hydrogen. So we are basically looking at the, the second last step to what we are calling a clean energy supply system. So green hydrogen, as you put it, mm -hmm. is where we break water into hydrogen and oxygen mm -hmm. using renewable resources. And that way, we have uh, an energy storage media that is free of fossil origin. That, that's where the hydrogen debate comes in. Now, mm -hmm. hydrogen is a very small molecule, but it is one of the building blocks of any hydrocarbon, including uh, petroleum, including coal and others. So once we have that molecule, uh, we can be able to combine it with, for example, nitrogen in the air or CO2 in the air or from our other uh, sources and uh, make the synthetic fuels that I was talking about. So the idea is uh, we can use uh, hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, to power most of our uh, vehicular applications. We can use it to as a feedstock for production of uh, methanol uh, for ships and other heavy transport, mm -hmm. or ammonia to energize our plants or rather to fertilize our, our farms. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, 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 the basis of green hydrogen. Right. We can also use it in the steel industry with the CO2 mm -hmm. to come up with what you're calling green steel. So our manufacturing sector can actually run on uh, a green trajectory. Okay, okay. But my concern is to get this hydrogen, because if you, if you go and look for it in, uh, if you go and mine for it per se, get its natural sources, it, it only accounts for 1%, the total hydrogen production in the world. So this particular hydrogen, green hydrogen, needs to be from water molecules. We break down the water molecules, right, to get that hydrogen. Mm. So yes. that water that we are breaking down to get the hydrogen is what is a scarce resource here in here in our country and maybe across Africa, is it then feasible to be using, to be breaking down water molecules to access the hydrogen, yet we don't have enough water? Actually, actually, you know, uh, for me, I'm usually optimistic in the sense that uh, even right now, we don't have access to water, leave alone the green hydrogen. We don't have access to potable water mm -hmm. or clean water in our cities. Mm -hmm. What are we doing about it? Mm -hmm. So the issue is, uh, uh, we can use it to draw synergies in water purification because uh, we do not have sources of fresh water and therefore we 
basically have to use renewable energy to desalinate water anyway. Then if you look at the hydrogen uh, production cycle, the percentage of, uh, of uh, desalination of water, the energy that is consumed in desalination, is very small compared to the other processes of hydrogen production uh, chain. So uh, in the context of uh, green hydrogen production, desalination only takes a very, very small fraction of the requirement. Uh, for that. Okay. And of course, we have a lot of saline uh, uh, water in our sinks. Water is there in print. Okay. But the process of desalinating is expensive. So I, I wanted to also follow up on something you had mentioned that we can use that hydrogen to combine it with the CO2 from our atmosphere or the nitrogen and uh, get, uh, get the, uh, the synthetic products that you were talking about. But in that case, yes, aren't we just doing the same thing? We're still getting our hydrocarbon, the fossil fuels which ultimately will result in CO2 emissions. So it's, 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 we are still getting CO2 emissions just from a different source. Uh, that's a very interesting question because uh, yeah. uh, I would want now to clarify the aspect of uh, CO2 emission. The aspect of CO2 emission is that we uncover the buried carbon, you know, mm -hmm. which is buried underground. We bring it to the atmosphere. But uh, with the capturing of the CO2 within the atmosphere mm -hmm. and put it in the cycle, mm -hmm. we, are, we are cutting short the relationship between what is below the ground and what is above ground. So in essence, we are reducing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, I, under I hear where you're coming from. So yes, I would yes. also like to cover the issue of storage of hydrogen. Um, it seems to be problematic because hydrogen takes up a lot of space and for practical purposes, they tend to compress it in vessels and that usually tends to make the vessels uh, brittle because the, the hydrogen molecules creep into the walls of the vessel. And there's a case uh, in Germany where a whole fleet of hydrogen buses had to be retired because the hydrogen filling station broke down and it, had, it was, I think, a one-year station and it cost them 2.3 million euros. So bringing it home, all things considered, is hydrogen a fuel that African countries can afford? Um, I, I don't know, uh, because sometimes I hear these cases, what we call uh, isolated cases, uh, being uh, fronted uh, as uh, the status quo. But uh, hydrogen is used everywhere. For example, the fats that we consume, they use hydrogen. Where do we store it? The cooking oil, I mean the, the, the cooking fat. We have been using it for centuries or not, not centuries, for decades. Where, where, does the, where is this hydrogen store? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, hydrogen is not a new thing. It has been there for many years and it is stored and we get, or not, we have been using it. So if there is a, some uh, storage, uh, storage system must have high integrity. That's all what is needed. But uh, if there was an error in terms of uh, the storage uh, system for the particular buses, it doesn't mean that uh, we cannot be able to store hydrogen. I, I'm not saying that it is easy to store it, but it, is, uh, it possesses no more difficulties with any other uh, form of uh, uh, gaseous fuel. Okay. So but, let's assume that we are able to get lots of water to access our hydrogen and that we overcome the challenges of storing the hydrogen, we still have to look at a hydrogen, the fact that a hydrogen economy is based on the availability of two metals, uh, platinum and iridium. And these two metals are used to, in making the proton exchange membrane in the hydrogen fuel cells, and they're very expensive and very rare. So with the limited availability of expensive minerals for making the hydrogen fuel cells, how feasible is it for us, African countries, to adopt hydrogen to replace fossil fuels in this energy transition? I don't know um, whether um, uh, uh, I would be right to put it this way, that uh, we also know that Africa is one of the richest uh, uh, continents in terms of uh, minerals. And uh, it is true that uh, some of the fuel cells uh, require some uh, rare resources. But uh, what I can put to you is that uh, we have researchers who are looking at various alternative uh, materials for uh, fabrication or for 
manufacture of uh, alternative fuel cells. We don't only have one type of fuel cells, we have various types of uh, uh, electrolyzers and fuel cells, and uh, research is ongoing. It's the same story with batteries. We started with the lead acid batteries, with the lithium ion, and, and we have developed that industry so far. So even with the, with the fuel cell and the electrolyzers, there are alternative materials that are there, which will be able to either break our water into hydrogen and oxygen, or even combine hydrogen with oxygen to generate electricity. So I, I don't see a, a big problem, but it's a concern that uh, researchers are focusing on in terms of uh, the green hydrogen research. Right, right, yeah. Just to lay a bit of a context, uh, on average, one megawatt of wind capacity requires about 100 tons of stainless steel, 400 tons of concrete, 20 tons of iron, 3 tons of copper, and 7 tons of fiberglass, which all go into making the blades of the, of the wind turbine. So the derivat my question is, the derivatives of crude oil, specifically the fiberglass that is used to make the blades of the wind turbine, is produced from petrochemicals. Uh, what then is the rationale behind an energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables such as wind energy when the production of the wind turbines themselves currently depends on fossil fuels? Or is there another technology that perhaps we are not aware of that is being used to make these wind turbines? So, for example, when you talk of uh, concrete, when you talk of uh, steel, iron, right. those are uh, natural resources. Mm -hmm. So you only need, for example, uh, uh, fiber, maybe the fiber you think that is what is coming from uh, petroleum, for example. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the materials are basically uh, natural minerals which we extract and uh, use now the fossil fuels to, to make them. And uh, stepping out from the, the green hydrogen discussion, we can say that if we are able now to uh, generate our green hydrogen, use it in the, what you're calling green steel manufacture. We have already eliminated the aspect of the fossil fuel. And again, mm -hmm. coming out from the same, we capture CO2 from the atmosphere. We can also make our, our fiberglass, for example. You capture CO2 to, uh, to make the fiberglasses? Yes. We, we, we capture CO2 from, what, what, what I said is that we want to have a cyclic uh, reuse of CO2 mm -hmm. within the atmosphere without going under ground or without going below ground it's possible okay what is the I problem if you what is the problem in accessing the co2 that is underground the, the, the problem with accessing the co2 that is underground is that uh, we are using it or we are releasing it in the atmosphere at a rate that is 100 more than 100 times faster than the time it took to store it there mm -hmm. if we go into the bio oils do we run the risk of um, then going into issues of food security <laughs> because they're using plants and um, can we do that to scale with the amount of oil that we need to work on the, to run these turbines? Uh, usually I'm also uh, usually interested in this debate of uh, food versus energy crisis, food versus uh, land issues and uh, water uh, and I always wonder for example if somebody told you that uh, I have a bag of maize that uh, the government is buying at 3,000 for food, and then somebody somewhere says, no, I can give it, uh, give 4,000 to you to go and make my ethanol for my car, where would you, where would you put your, where would you take your bag of maize? So usually I look at it from the positive side that uh, when we introduce um, uh, avenues of using our resources, our bioresources, we empower the producer. The producer gets uh, what you call the, 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 the bargaining power. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we are going to, once we, we, they have a higher bargaining power, then they are able to produce more. Okay. For example, our animals, our cows are now running on uh, silage. People are, are uh, cultivating very uh, semi harid lands and planting a lot of maize, not for food, but to produce a lot for the, for the cows. So that way, uh, you can see we have cleared most of the bushes and uh, we have put most of the farms into, into useful 
uh, activities by just creating silage for the animals. So this is, a, this is an, an avenue, this is an, 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 a route which was not explored some few years back. Mm -hmm. So I don't see bioenergy as a competitor or as a crisis. I see it as an opportunity that the producer or somebody who's been farming can actually uh, invest in their land with the hope that if food doesn't work, mm -hmm. if I can sell my produce as food, mm -hmm. I can sell it as an energy feedstock. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Let me stop you for a bit uh, as we need to take another short break. So, yeah, let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Please don't go away. <laughs> 